Why hello my fellow apes, I hope you are well. Buckle up, because today we're going on a wild ride into the twisted mind of Dr. Paul Copen, prominent Christian apologist extraordinaire. Here's a fair warning. Some of the things Paul defends makes me want to hug the nearest puppy to cleanse my metaphorical soul. You see, Paul has an astonishing talent for defending the most gut-wrenchingly awful acts imaginable. Let me tantalise you with some examples. We'll start off innocent enough. Suppose you had a lovely summer's day, a wonderful picnic, and to wash it all down you murdered a family, gave their daughter a month to mourn, and then forced her to marry you. Well, don't feel bad. Paul says that this is compassionate. This is a very uh, humane, kind, gracious, compassionate way of arranging things. See? It's compassionate. Very kind. Much gracious. Many love. Here's another example. Ever felt judged for sending bears to maul to death children who made fun of your bald head? I bet you have. But worry not, dear child, for Paul is here to assure us that this was God's righteous judgement. It wasn't just a good thing, it was the maximally good thing. So it's not as though there's this cranky prophet who is annoyed with these little kids and just sends out these bears. This is the judgement of God. Ah, here's one. Have you ever felt bad about that slave that you keep in your basement and now and then discipline with a wooden rod? Again, Paul can fix it. It really makes it very humane, makes it very compassionate, and so forth. Oh, and here's a classic. Have you ever regretted murdering all the firstborn in a nation? Well, Paul's your guy. Egypt is getting divine judgment because it has not shown regard for God's firstborn, and so Israel's firstborn is going to, re, you know, going to receive the judgment. And if, this is like a last resort measure. God is, isn't able to get Pharaoh's attention, as it were, uh, through these other plagues. And so finally it is in this severe judgment that finally Pharaoh gives up and says, okay, uh, take your people and go. All right, last one. Have you ever forced yourself on someone hoping they'd be forced to marry you? Well, lucky you, because Paul's got your back on this one too. This is a, a, a an example of seduction rather than forcible rape. Indeed, it's quite the apologetic feast before us, ain't it? So rather than overwhelm ourselves with the full coping catastrophe all at once, we go through this at a leisurely pace. In some time in the future, we get to how Paul turns the nightmare of Numbers 31 into the notebook. But for now, we'll introduce the apologist himself, and then take a look at his justification for why you shouldn't be afraid to send bears to maul little children down if they've said mean words to you. An introduction to our guest of honour is in order. Born in 1962, Paul Copen has established himself as a leading voice in contemporary Christian apologetics, engaging with a wide range of topics that intersect faith, reason, and morality. He holds a PhD in philosophy from Marquette University, and has taught at various academic institutions, including Palm Beach Atlantic University and the University of Florida. He is the author of numerous books, such as True For You But Not For Me, Overcoming Objections to Christian Faith. Another of his stellar books is titled Is God a Moral Monster? Making Sense of the Old Testament God, and most recently, Is God a Vindictive Bully? In his books, Paul explores the more troubling passages in the Bible, and seeks to defend them by reframing the context with a wider cultural and societal framework. Paul is typically academic and respectful, but similar to other Christian intellectuals, the content of what he says is no better than the most ignorant and scornful apologists. For instance, Paul has argued that atheists can't believe in objective morality since, according to Paul, objective morality only exists within a theistic worldview. This is one of those claims that has been so thoroughly debunked that it actually pains me to see it come up again and again and again. What is it about morality not being grounded in a supernatural dictator that makes theists so uneasy? Well, for more on this discussion, have a look at my episodes on Dennis Prager and religious morality. But for now, let's just enjoy the irony that someone who will go on to justify the murder of children and the taking of children as sex slaves has the audacity to question others on their ethics. Truly, the arrogance of Christian humility never ceases to miss its mark. We start our exploration of Paul's views by looking at the beautiful story of how God, in his all-loving wisdom, decided to send a couple of bears to maul 42 children to death for calling his prophet Elijah bold. Here be the King James Version. And he, Elijah, went up from thence unto Bethel. 
And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city, and mocked him, and said unto him, Go up, thou boldhead. Go up, thou boldhead. Damn, sick burns. These children are wild, I tell you. Let's see how Elijah responded. And he turned back, and looked on them, and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood, and tear forty and two children off them. Now isn't that a lovely bedtime story fit for children? We see Elijah, a hero of God, courageously and morally reacting to being mocked by children for being bold. I mean, I, I imagine that pretty much everyone that's bold has called for a divine intervention when being mocked. I mean, if not, then why not give it a go? According to the Bible, God might just answer your prayers. So there's the lovely story. Let's now turn to our apologetic acrobat Paul Copen and see how this was not only sensible, but actually completely just. The passage that is being referred to, of course, we need to keep in mind that, uh, well, the, the baldy portion, uh, compared to Elijah, who was very hairy, we read in, uh, in uh, 2 Kings 1, yeah, that uh, by contrast, his successor was, uh, you know, didn't have all that you know, all that kind of hair. Ah, so in contrast to Elijah's hair, the plot thickens. Clearly Elijah was a bit embarrassed about his lack of hair, and I guess that this is a good thing to keep in mind if you think his reaction was a bit over the top. We come to the passage where these youths are, and they're not little kids. Wait, what? They're not little kids. And they're not little kids. Oh, oh I see. I've gone and done a silly, haven't I? I read the text, which explicitly specifies that they were little children, when really this means that they were not little children. Sorry Paul, do continue to enlighten us. We come to the passage where these youths are, and they're not little kids. Uh, keep in mind that David was, you know, these terms are used of David when he was about to fight Goliath, uh, you know, Solomon when he became king. Uh, and, and also, it basically is a term used of those who are unmarried males uh, who, you know, again, they're, they're, old, they're old, old enough, teenagers, early 20s, uh, who don't have their own households. Alrighty, so we've got a few claims here. First, Paul presents the little children as if they were actually unmarried males. Unmarried males who additionally don't own households. Who don't have their own households. And as for how he's concluded that the 42 little children were all male, I don't know, and neither will you since Paul doesn't share his workings. And as for how Paul dresses these little children in the garb of unmarried adults, well, he's emphasised that the term little child was used in reference to David when he was about to fight Goliath, and Solomon when he became king. So let's take a look at these cases, shall we? David is described as a youth in 1 Samuel 17, 33, and in verse 42, Goliath looks at David and sees him as only a youth, a ruddy and handsome in appearance. Now given the description and the customs of the time, scholars suggest that David might have been in his late teens or perhaps early twenties when this event took place. But more to the point, notice that, unlike the little children that got mauled to death, David is not at all described as a little child. The Bible describes David as a youth. Note further the confidence that Paul embodied when expressing this tripe, because that's apologetics for you. It's not about truth, it's about keeping you on your knees, saving souls, as they say. Fortunately for Paul, however, he's on a bit better footing when it comes to Solomon. In 1 Kings 3.7, Solomon refers to himself as a little child, which has led some Jewish traditions and commentaries to place him between the ages of 12 and 15. So, what Paul has done here is taken a verse that uses the same language, where the age of the individual being referenced is heavily speculative, and he's inferred from this that all 42 little children that were mauled to death because God is all-loving were actually teenagers. All male, unmarried, and without a household. Unmarried males uh, who, you know, again, they're, they're, old, they're old, old enough, teenagers, early 20s, uh, who don't have their own household. It's amazing, right? This man has a PhD in philosophy, and yet his reasoning is akin to a little child's. Which might mean I'm referring to a pensioner, by the way, and so maybe I'm complimenting him. But hell to it. Let's indulge Paul and assume for argument's sake that those mean 42 little children were actually young men. Does this make it okay to have them butchered for calling someone baldy? 
Now, I don't know about you, but for me, murdering 42 children, or youths, or even adults, seems slightly disproportionate to the crime. But then again, I guess that since this was God who commanded the act, perhaps when the little children felt the immense force of the bears pierce through their flesh and skulls, well, it didn't really hurt, it, it, it just felt lovely and gooey, like they were surrounded by an all-loving aura. Yeah, that's the one. I keep forgetting, don't I, that I shouldn't question the true love of the Almighty. Anyhow, back to Paul. As we see in, in Second, Second Kings uh, chapter 2, all, so, so when Elisha is being, being severe, keep in mind the judgments or the punishments that are threatened to Israel if they disobey the covenant. One of them, as we read at the end of Leviticus, says that God will send wild beasts against them, and they will be bereft of their children. And that is exactly what happens. So that term bereft is used in the narrative when Elisha goes to Jericho. The land had been bereft. Uh, it had been unfruitful, and so he makes it fruitful. When he goes to this place that is a center of idolatry and is rebuffed, is mocked, uh, by these who are probably not just those who are part of the royal house, but also pro probably part of the uh, the, the temple uh, religious system in in Bethel, uh, that uh, that they are uh, mocking uh, and and violating the covenant because they're not listening to the prophet who has been sent from God. Who, if you listen to him, will bring fruitfulness, will bring blessing. But if you resist him, there will be judgment that comes. And so it's not as though there's this cranky prophet who is annoyed with these little kids and just sends out these bears. This is the judgment of God. This is what God has promised for the, against those who violate his covenant, who refuse to listen to his voice, uh, that they will be bereft of their children. Right. Let's get this straight. So an all-loving God decided to punish the adults of 42 of the little children. But rather than punishing, you know, the adults, the criminals, he punished their innocent little children by having two bears rip them limb from limb. And rather than punishing the adults by having their little children eviscerated, as and when the adults violated the covenant, he executed judgment only when the little children mocked Elijah. Seriously, my Abrahamic acquaintances. How do you take this bullshit seriously? This isn't a rhetorical question. How do you take this bullshit seriously? Paul's reasoning here is utterly absurd. But you know what? Let's grant it for the sake of argument. The little children were actually not little children, but rather very big mean men, who were unmarried, had no household, were all children of parents who violated the covenant, were all involved in calling Elijah bold, and God chose to enact his vengeance on the parents of the little children only when the parents' little children uttered some bad words at Elijah. It's a tall order, Paul, but we're granted. Now then, where does this leave us? Exactly where we started, with a vindictive God that's a far cry from all loving. Responding to the concerns of God not seeming to be all that loving when he sends bears to kill little children for uttering words, by saying that God killed the young men for a completely different crime that their parents committed, is not only absolute lunacy, but it completely fails to address the concern. It is, straight up, Apologetics. It's apologetics. It's good, wholesome stuff, I tell you. Can you see the apologetic acrobatics at play here? The required contortion to provide just a glimmer of hope that these verses are not as despicable as they seem. In wrapping up, let's just consider the supposed loving nature of God once more. When Lot's wife turned and looked at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, God punished her by turning her into a pillar of salt. This, in and of itself, is a reaction that's not exactly all-loving, is it? But we can presume that it wasn't painful. Being turned to salt would presumably be a swift death. More importantly, though, note that God punished Lot's wife because of her actions. Conversely, when people broke their covenant with God, God chose not to punish them, but to punish 42 of their little children only when their children insulted Elijah. Indeed, an all-loving God used little children as a means to an end. And unlike being turned to soul, God saw fit to have these children turned into carcasses by two bears, which, let's face it, is very unlikely to be an easy death for all 42 of the little children. This depicts God as a cruel, petty, capricious, vindictive prick. 
it betrays the Almighty as willing to deploy horrific violence in response to non-violent verbal insults. One thing should be clear here. A god who conducts himself in this way is not morally perfect, and if there is an all-loving god, affiliation with the Bible has been its greatest insult. Anyhow, I hope that you've learned your lesson, little children. If someone tells you that they are a prophet of God, then you better not mock them, for if you do, then God will, in his all-loving way, send some wild beasts down to kill you for some crime that your ancestors committed. So just listen to the prophet and let them make your land fruitful. I want to conclude by thanking Paul. What we've just seen here, and what we're going to see in future instalments, is a beautiful example of how the apologist mindset works. There is no horror in scripture that they won't distort and spin into a facade of love. That's really helpful that again, he's not talking about children. Uh, these people had been warned. They're mocking a prophet of the Lord, and a whole lot is at stake. 